Hi, I'm Stephanie Kent, and I am the manager of Docents and Tours at the Blanton Museum of Art at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to our series, Curated Conversations. Today, our topic is Teaching Tours and Touching Tales, a docent Q&A. I'm joined today by several of our gallery teachers, which is how we typically refer to our docents at the Blanton. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our docents. Um, let's start with, uh, do we have Dave Pinckney? Hello. And we have Frances Thompson. Can you give us a wave? Hello. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and we have Jeannie Buderer. Hi. We've got Adriana Villa Rota. Hi. Thank you. We've got uh, Gina Panza Woodruff. Hi. And we've got Lorraine Ladston. Hi, everyone. Wonderful. So that is our team for the day. I think I got everyone. Um, before we start, there are a few notes. Just to let you all know, as audience members, your audio is muted so nobody can hear you. And only the panelists are going to be visible on the screen today. We'll be taking questions. Um, we'll be looking at them throughout uh, the panel today. And you can submit your questions using the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, there's a specific icon that says Q&A on it. We would love if you would put your questions in there instead of in the general chat. Now, before we get started, because it's happy hour, we hope that you fixed your favorite refreshing drink. And please raise your glass to toast. We made it to the end of the day. I've got my water. <laughs> So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, I'm gonna share a little bit with you all about my position at the Blanton and my background in getting there. So as I said before, I'm the manager of docents and tours at the Blanton. So that has two different parts to it. The first part is that I book all of our tours that happen in the museum. So this means school groups and university groups. It means adult groups coming to visit, public tours. Um, all sorts of different groups that come through the museum, those bookings go through me. So some of you may have talked to me over email before. Um, I also manage our docent program or our gallery teaching program. This means that I schedule the docents when they go on their tours. I recruit and train new docents. I run slash manage our training program and our professional learning program. And then I also teach in the galleries. I teach pre-K up through adults. Um, and community groups in our galleries as well. So my personal background is in education and in theater, so a bit of a dual background. Um, I'm a former high school math teacher, um, and I left the East Coast about six years ago to come to Austin um, to get my master's here at UT um, in drama and theater for youth and communities. And um, that got me into working in the arts um, across all ranges, theater, visual arts, movement, um, and working with teachers um, across the county about how to integrate the arts into their classrooms. Um, and that's what ended up bringing me to the Blanton. I actually did my graduate thesis with a lot of the docents that you're seeing on the screen right now, um, doing trainings with them around integrating theater into uh, gallery teaching. So that's enough about me. A little bit about our gallery teaching program. We typically bring in a new cohort of docents every two years. Um, that would have been this fall. We're postponing it for a little bit, as you can imagine. Um, but we're really looking forward to the time that we can have a new docent cohort. Our new docents go through a training process that you'll hear a little bit about later from one of our docents. They do some observations in the galleries, and then they're ready to hit the ground running. We require our docents to be available either one weekday a week or one weekend day a week. Our weekday docents teach between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. typically, and they teach um, pre-K through 12 students. Our weekend docents typically work in the afternoons, um, and they are doing our public tours. If you haven't been on one of our public tours before, they're fantastic, and they uh, happen in our 
uh, collection that is permanent at the Blanton, but then they also happen in our special exhibitions that rotate. Um, so on the weekends, um, not currently, but sometime in the future, they'll be back and you should definitely come and check one out. So we are here for the gallery teachers. So let's go ahead um, and give them some time to introduce themselves. They're gonna share their names again, um, maybe tell you how long they've been at the Blanton, um, a little bit about what they do when they're not at the Blanton, and perhaps a little story about what brought them into gallery teaching here at the Blanton. So if, that's, if it's all right, Jeannie, can we start it with you? You certainly may. Um, I have been at the Blanton for seven really great years. I um, decided I wanted to be uh, a docent a long, a, a long time ago. My, my first encounter in, a, in an art museum was when I was in the third grade, and it was love at first sight. And I have been passionate uh, about learning about art and going to art museums ever since. And so I promised myself that one day I wanted to be involved in one. So um, after I retired from teaching high school, I applied to the Blanton and I was happily accepted. Um, or I was happy I was accepted. Uh, <laughs> and um, what I do when, when I'm not at the museum, uh, lots of things I love to do. One of the top two are traveling with my husband and cooking and trying new recipes. So obviously I have been in the kitchen a lot in the past few months and galettes are now my favorite things to make. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeannie. That's very exciting. And Jeannie is my fellow high school, former high school teacher at the plant and I love that. Um, so let's move on. Um, Adriana, do you wanna go ahead and share a little bit with us? Hello, my name is Adriana Villarrota. I'm a humanistic psychologist. I have been involved in human, in women's social and political participation, and we get Kamala Harris today. I'm writing a book about promin a prominent Mexican wom uh, woman leader. Since my husband and I arrived in Austin five years ago, we have created a friendly community at the Blanton, along with our friend Lorraine, this Lorraine that is here, Lorraine Laston. Uh, the Blanton and Lorraine have played a key role in creating this fantastic community we are enjoying. I call the Blanton the gallery of our home, and I enjoy sharing its collections and events with family, friends, and visitors. I'm writing poetry and exploring the mystery or the mystery and magic of watercolor. In my first exposure to conceptual art, I felt very disappointed because I couldn't understand it. Thanks to a docent and her guided tour, I was able to appreciate and get a deeper meaning of Hoffnick's work. Since then, I wanted to have the opportunity to build the bridge from the frustration of the unknown to the appreciation and enjoyment of different expressions of plastic arts. That's the reason I'm, I'm at the plant. Thank you so much, Adriana, and I love to hear those stories about how a previous museum experience really brought you um, to be a docent, which we heard from Jeannie as well. I'm wondering if we could move on to Gina. Would you like to share a little with us? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. So I've been a gallery teacher for three years, and I came to the Blanton because I was transitioning from a career in high tech to creativity coaching. And I wanted to gain experience in developing art-based lesson plans and teaching in front of various age groups. On a personal note, um, I love being at art museums and teaching at the Blanton helps me honor the memory of my father. He enjoyed learning about art and took our family to museums all over the world. So I really love that on my tours, I can teach kids about other cultures through the art at the Blanton. And when um, I'm not giving tours, I'm a busy mom of three tween teenage boys, um, being a creativity coach and continuing my career transition. I'm applying to graduate school for art therapy 
And I also work part-time at ArtSpark Texas, which is an arts and disability nonprofit. And we at the Blanton love ArtSpark. You should definitely check them out. And Gina, we are crossing our fingers for you and grad school. That is so exciting. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Dave, do you want to share a little bit with us? Uh, certainly. So I've been a docent at the Blanton for going on 20 years now. Uh, before I was at the Blanton, I had a career in high tech, uh, developing mostly software for telephone companies. And more recently, I've retired from that and I've transitioned to becoming a uh, professional com commercial photographer, just recently certified by the National Professional Photographers Guild. And I looked at the opportunity to docent at the Blanton as a way to weld and merge the, uh, the interest I had in being, being an artist. I've been a photographer for going on 40 years now um, with my desire to learn more about the artworks and what better way to do that than by delving into them and, and then teaching uh, the general public about how these artworks function and, and what they what they might tend to do. Thank you so much, Dave. Y'all, I'm learning more about our docents today too, so this is very exciting. Um, let's go ahead and Lorraine, do you want to share a little bit with us about your journey? Um, sure. First of all, I want to thank Adriana for that lovely <laughs> remarks. <laughs> um, I too have uh, a couple of mentors, Marion Werner and, and former and Ann Dawson, who, who helped me. But I was born and raised in South Africa, and my family is uh, very, very involved in the art world, ballet, theater, jazz, music, visual arts. So I grew up with, with art, and I, my background is in art history. And I, I went to, after university, I went to London and was in theater. So that's, I was very happy when I met Stephanie, another theater person. And um, actually, you got involved uh, with, uh, I love UT, I bleed orange. And um, I was started off as a volunteer at the reception desk under Martha, uh, Martha's cohort. And um, I took it upon myself to learn the artworks one, uh, kind of one by one and took it upon myself to take unsuspecting visitors upstairs, <laughs> leaving the desk and giving them pop-up tours, which I'm then became famous for <laughs> and but I loved it and these two Marion and Anne came to me one day and said what are you doing and I said I'm giving tours and they said no no no, you're not giving tours you're, you're supposed to be at the desk so they persuaded me to join the Do the Dosen cohort and when I'm not doing that I have run my own marketing firm specializing in engineers architects and construction companies and my secret vice when I'm not docenting is being the other judge that you don't see on all the talent shows, The Voice, America's Got Talent, World of Dance, So You Think You Can Dance, all of these things. And I also serve on the Austin Classical Guitar, Ballet Board, um, Chamber Music Board, and other arts groups um, as a volunteer. Thank you so much, Lorraine. And I love that you told the story about starting out as a volunteer. Um, a lot of our docents actually start out that way, start as a volunteer and then um, ease into becoming a docent. So that's also a great way um, to, to join the Blanton community. Um, so last but definitely not least, Francis, do you want to share a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you so much, Stephanie. It's an honor to be part of this group and I love seeing you all since we can't see each other yet in the galleries, but I'm excited about that coming up. I moved back to Austin. I was born here but did not go to UT. So it took me a little while to get to the campus, but I um, moved back here in 2004 and there were interviews for a new docent corps because they were opening a new building in 2006. So David actually was one of those interviewing me because he was an elder docent. So I've been, I, we don't call each other older or newer. We say veteran, experienced, you know, whatever. Um, been around the block, but I have been doing this for 16 years and I absolutely love it. I also thought about something Jeannie said. She said that she was reminded of being a young girl and going to museums. I grew up in Dallas most of the time and the North Park Mall 
North Park Center is full of art, full of the Nasher art collection, way before there ever was a Nasher, and really almost rivaling what was at the Dallas Museum of Art was art in the shopping mall. And it was a great privilege to be able to run loose in North Park to look at the art. So here I am back in um, Austin, and there's this great big building, not a mall, so I can give my time, not spend any money. And I thought, I've got to do this. I was a young mother. I wanted to belong somewhere to a community that didn't necessarily involve my children. And the Blanton gave me that community. It taught me so much. It continues to teach me. I was not an art major. And I also wanted to better myself with public speaking and communication skills. I was a journalist and in public relations, but more often not speaking. And the Blanton also has given me that opportunity to speak in front of school groups, adults, out-of-town visitors, um, young people who may not have thought they really wanted to be there. So that is why I'm a docent, why I'm still a docent, 16 years running, and I'm also the docent coordinator at the Umlauf Sculpture Garden and Museum. I'm a very active music volunteer in town with KUTX and with ACL. Um, I'm also a museum, excuse me, a um, ballet Austin Nutcracker docent during the Nutcracker season. So I enjoy sharing and interacting and um, Austin's only grown stronger in the many years that the Blanton has contributed to the art scene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. You can see that our docents are incredibly busy people, um, but people who just really love um, the arts and sharing about the arts. Um, but you can tell that they come from a lot of different backgrounds. You do not have to be a practicing artist to be a docent. You do not have to be a former teacher to be a docent. Um, these are all skills that we work on in training. Um, you just have to be excited um, about the museum and about sharing art. Um, so a little bit about that training and about what the experience is like, just some, some nuts and bolts of what it's like to be a docent. Um, I was wondering, Gina, I think that you are our newest <laughs> docent. We're not talking about youngest or old, oldest, but our newest docent on the panel. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk just briefly about what the training to be a docent is like. Yes, yeah, so it is a lot of fun. Let me just say that. Um, when we start as new gallery teachers, we meet as a group. I think when I went through it, it was a weekly training with the education team and we learned about art based activities, creating the lesson plans and the footpaths for our tours so we don't all run into each other while we have a group of kids going through, through the museum. Um, and then we learned about the works of art um, at the Blanton through the collections and curatorial staff. So um, as a gallery teacher, the trainings continue throughout the year. Um, we learn about the rotating exhibitions, workshops with guest speakers and in-depth art history talks. And before we get thrown into giving tours, um, if you're like me, I was a little uncomfortable doing it at first. We get to shadow uh, the various docents and gallery teachers because everyone has a little bit of a different style of teaching. So this is where I gained a lot of practical knowledge and I'm so grateful for the support and encouragement from the longtime docents. Um, we get together before and after tours to discuss what went well and where we can improve. So there's always a continued learning process and uh, you know, we learn from each other as well as the, the staff at the Blanton. Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, the docents are such a wonderful community. Um, you will find them sometimes after training has been over for two or three hours they are sitting outside at a table or sitting at the cafe um, talking about the training, talking about their lives with one another. Um, and it always warms my heart to see that. I'm hoping that we can do that again sometime soon in the future. Um, so another thing that we've been talking about is the fact that there are are all different types of tours. Um, we have tours with young people, with pre-K through 12 that our gallery teachers or our docents lead, um, but then they also lead tours with adults and public tours. Um, Lorraine, I know that you're one of our docents who's done actually all of these things. So I was wondering if you might wanna share just a little bit about what the difference might be between a public tour or an adult tour or working with uh, young people. Well, um, thanks to the training, one of the things you learn in training is what are these different groups like? 
and there, there are different learning styles. There's kinetic, there's hearing, there's visual. There are different kinds of learners. And then you've got your elementary school, you've got your little ones, you've got your teens, as, as people will tell you. And you've, then you've got your adults. And you, you learn quite quickly that the adults are there. They're going to stand in front of you and say, teach me. Whereas the kids are going to come and sit on the floor and do whatever you tell them with activities. But over the, the 10 years or so, 12 years I've been there, I've slowly realized, and maybe the theater background, that adults are not that different from kids. Actually, if you, if you engage with adults and the activity is there for them to see the artwork in a new way, they're actually quite responsive and will I have never got an adult group to dance yet. I've got the kids to dance, but the adult groups would not dance. But um, it is amazing how much, if you, if you really think about it, you can bring the same engaging strategies to adults and kids. And that's part of the joy of learning about the artwork. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, so we have our first question here. Um, it is when did the docent program start at the Blanton? Dave, I'm wondering if you might know the answer to that. I actually do not. I probably should, but I do not. And I'm saying that right now on live Zoom. So the Blanton Museum has gone through a number of iterations. Uh, earlier it was at the, uh, the art school building and before that it had a number of different names. It was once in the building that is now the Harry Ransom Center. Um, so we have docents um, in the program that went back um, 30 years, 40 years ago. Um, so yes, it, it's been around since the 70s at least, if not before. Thank you so much. Wow, y'all just learning so much today. Um, Dave, do you want to go ahead and share a story with us, maybe about um, your experiences at the museum? Uh, sure. So there's, I do public tours, mostly nights and weekends, and that's a different audience than the schools, you know, bring to the, to the museum. And you get, um, you get to see a different slice of the, of the Austin community. Uh, recently, there was a public outreach event where we had hundreds of people coming through the museum who are not normal, everyday and regular visitors to the museum. So these are people who are not accustomed to the particular artworks they're looking at and not accustomed to, to evaluating artworks, to looking at things and responding to them. And uh, one note in particular was in a section of the contemporary galleries we call the minimalist room, uh, which has a number of works which are quite challenging um, to, to the neophyte. There was one work in particular, which I generally don't use because it is so challenging uh, to the novice uh, user. Uh, and it's just been brought up on the screen there. And you can see that this, you know, it's two white panels with a black border and, in under, and underneath the black border, there's, a, there's an olive green uh, stroke around the central white panel. This work um, drew everyone. Everybody had an opinion and was going to be heard about this work. You could see couples putting their heads together and pointing from across the room, or groups of people would just stride up very purposefully and point and gesture and gesticulate and have very animated discussions about this artwork. And I thought, you know, okay, we're here in the minimalist gallery, which is distillations of the art experience. And is that not the kind of purest uh, essence of what these objects are in the museum for, to get the viewers to engage with each other about them. So I had to say, well done, Ms. Bear, for uh, being able to put this, this artwork out there. 
I love that. Thank you so much, Dave. And I want to remind you all that are watching, um, you are welcome to put in questions at any moment. Um, the gallery teachers are going to share some stories about their experience, um, but we can also mix that in with answering questions if um, something that they have said or that they, that they say coming up sparks a question for you. Um, Adriana, I know that you kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I would love for us to hear a little more. Um, you've been working with a really specific group at the Blanton and, and that's been growing and expanding. Do you, do you mind sharing with us a little bit about that? Of course, Steffi, I love to share this tale with you because we are about 90 women involved now. Uh, at the end of 2018, Alina Flores, the wife of the then Mexican consul, and I started developing a program of monthly visits to the Blanton <clears throat> for Mexican women in Austin in order to learn about the collection and develop a deeper appreciation. The group quickly grew to 30 women, some of whom have lived here for years but have never visited the Blanton. In mid-2019, a new Mexican consul, Ambassador Pablo Marentes, arrived in Mexico with his wife, Patricia Lerdo de Tejada. Patricia is very involved with the art world, and she is a leader of an art organization in Mexico, Adopte Una Obra de Arte. He immediately expressed an interest in continuing and strengthening the group of Mexican women with a focus on the arts. We have developed a more comprehensive program of cultural, musical, and social activities. We had so much fun until March. In March, when we no longer could get together in person, we have not only managed to keep the group together through a chat we developed, but the group has more than double in size to more than 90 women who are registered now. We have named the group Austin Arte y Cultura. We have had Zoom lectures by prominent Mexican artists. We recognize and appreciate all the support provided by the Blanton Museum and its staff and the docents. We are excited that the Blanton will be opening its doors again and we can wait to return. We will also continue with invited presentations by artists and others via Zoom, primarily from Mexico. One of our goals is to build a bridge between the Blanton and Austin with the Mexican artists and intellectuals. Another goal is to continue to build and sustain a community of Latinx, Latinx friends interested in culture and the arts. Oh, Adriana, thank you so much for that. And I just love to hear how this group who started out by coming to the Blanton has grown so much and that you all are expanding and even um, in this really challenging time are still doing such exciting and beautiful things. Um, and we're excited to have you all back to the Blanton too. In the um, beginning, we called this the Blanton group, but we were advised that we shouldn't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> our name now is Austin Arte Cultura. That is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So we've gotten some stories about adult groups. I'm wondering um, if we can move on perhaps to Jeannie. I know that you had a story about um, some students, I think some seniors in high school maybe at the museum. I did. I had a, this was um, last spring and um, it turned out to be a, a very wonderful tour. There were 10 girls 
and um, this is the spring of their senior year and so we started our tour and they were they were just a lot of fun as as was their uh, uh, chaperone so we were going along and on our third stop we were at Madam CJ Walker the wonderful portrait uh, made completely of combs 3,000 combs by Sonia Clark and so we had a, a big discussion about that and of course um, they were they were quite fascinated by the fact that combs were used and so we got in of course uh, a discussion about well why combs well of course the reason for the combs was the fact that in case you don't know that madam cj walker uh built her career on making hair care products for african-american women and she was the very first african female african-american millionaire in the united states so as we talked about that after we finished our discussion i told the girls that now they were going to make some art and when you tell a group that all of a sudden it's like wait a minute we're not sure we want to do this but they were so nice and i said you're going to make a sculpture and so the prompt that i gave them was I want you to make a sculpture that represents who you are right now, not who you were yesterday, who you're going to be, what you aspire to, just who you are right now. And I always wait to do something like this till I've, I've gotten, I've built a rapport with the group and so that they understand that at the Blanton, uh, opinions are honored and that it is a very safe place to trot those opinions out and to also try on some new ideas so they went to work and all of the sculptures were were beautiful and I they knew that after they got finished we would go around the group and each one we were sitting in a circle and so each one would hold up their sculpture and they would talk about it and they were all very good but this one girl stands out in particular and she held up a very pretty swan that she had done and she said this this is me she said i look very serene on the top but underneath i'm madly paddling because i don't know what's going to happen when i graduate i i want to go to community college, but I don't know if there will be enough money for me to go. And that was really quite touching that she shared that with us. And artwork a lot of times will we'll do that. Um, I sincerely hope that she got her wish and that, that she got to go to community college. Jeannie, thank you so much. For that story. I don't think our visitors necessarily know um, how much they impact us when they come to the museum. Um, and I, I love having that story out there so people know that um, we are listening and, and we are, are learning too um, with our visitors in the museum. Um, there's a question here that I am happy to answer. Um, from Cindy, it says that the Blanton has done a lot these past few months to continue to bring art to our community when so much has been closed due to COVID-19. And how have the gallery teachers been involved in those efforts? Um, so, uh, Cindy, I wanted to say that, so summers are often a quiet time for our gallery teachers. Um, so many of them teach uh, our school students, so pre-K through 12 students, um, that uh, they end up not teaching as much over the summer. Also, a lot of our docents have children at home over the summer or travel over the summer. Um, and so we, um, what we have been doing to, con to continue our docent community or in our gallery teacher community is we are having um, a book club twice a, twice a month for anyone who is available and interested, and that's keeping our community going. 
Um, and we are going to see once the school year starts up again in September, um, what it's going to look like. And so uh, we don't have an answer for that right now, um, but we are, we are brainstorming about it as we speak. So thank you for that question. Um, so we have heard about a lot about tours or gallery lessons that we host in the museum, um, but we also sometimes host some events and these can be some pretty big events. Uh, Gina, I know you've been a part of a lot of these and I'm wondering if you would like to share um, about what it's like when all of these students just descend on the Blanton. Yes, so um, it's pretty exciting. Um, one of my favorite events that I've been a part of is the Art of the Book program. We, I'm also on the board of the Writers League of Texas and this is an opportunity to see a collaboration between children's books, art literacy, and museum education. So this program brings in um, authors and illustrators to the Blanton, and um, the uh, authors and illustrators will go to the auditorium and present to groups as large as 150, and the kids listen to them and then go into the gallery and they split up into smaller groups for a gallery rotation and an art-based activity. So last year, the photo that you're seeing on the left, um, M.T. Anderson and Eugene Yelchin came in to discuss their creative collaboration, um, their book, The Assassination of Bragwin Spurge. And the kids had the opportunity to talk with them while they were creating these fabulous newspaper um, costumes that they created, um, either based on a character from the book or from a work of art that they saw. So we had kids all over the museum, ripping newspaper up, taping it together, and what they produced was just amazing. We also had John Klassen come in talking about his Hat Trilogy books. And um, uh, I brought in a group of kids to work on the Frida uh, Berenik uh, piece, and we made a frozen image. It's a drama-based strategy. And uh, that was a really fun activity because the prompt that the kids got was basically just suddenly a gust of wind surrounded them and then they had to come up with the dramatiz dramatization um, of the story that they created. And then another fun um, activity that I was a part of was related to teachers. And this was um, a create your own adventure um, program and the teachers split up into different groups and they decided where they wanted their story to go and they went into different areas of the gallery um, and got to act out this script. So that was also a lot of fun. It, it, bringing all these groups in just, it, uh, it brings a lot of energy to the museum with so many people um, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. I love it. Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, the large groups brings in a ton of energy and just so much joy. Um, it takes a lot of energy on our part, but it's also so rejuvenating and recharges our batteries and gets us um, just so excited about teaching again. I wanted to mention the event that Gina um, first talked about, Art of the Book. Um, it is a partnership between us and book people. Um, our wonderful independent bookstore on North Lamar. Um, and they are a fabulous partner. Um, I also wanted to let you know that on our YouTube page for the Blanton, there is a video um, of the visit with John Klassen and he was absolutely incredible. I would recommend checking that video out. Um, there should be a link to it um, in the chat right now. Um, so thank you so much for that, Gina. Uh, so we've been hearing a little bit now about young people and how um, different strategies like these costumes or building uh, sculptures out of tinfoil um, can really engage young people with artwork. Um, Lorraine, you mentioned earlier about how strategies can engage um, older audiences or adult audiences with artwork too. And I was wondering if you'd like to tell a story about that. Um, yeah, I'd love to share one of these stories. Um, one of the strategies we get training on is what's called the poetry strategy, which we, um, we do very nicely with kids looking at artworks. But I also do with these adult tours, and I had a tour, um, there's a group called Ollie, that's the sort of the adult learning at UT, and 
the ladies there put together a tour. They wanted women in art. So they arrive and we, are, we go through our different stops looking at women uh, depicted in art and women artists themselves. And as, a, as Jeannie said, we get to know the people on these first stops and we really get a rapport with our group in the first conversations. So by the time we got to um, the minimalist, the dreaded minimalist room, I meant, told them um, that we're going to do a poetry activity. I've given them pencils and paper and they looked a little bit grumbly about that. But um, this is the Mary Kors artwork. So you can imagine the look on their faces when I said, okay, group, we're going to do a poetry uh, ex exercise with this work. But they were very, uh, very game. And this, this is a, such a great way to get people to engage in something that looks at first glance like just a white square with some other white squares. And uh, Mary Kors uses a particular material actually from, from making roads, microchips, and there's a lot going on in this work, but if you're just going past, as most people do, it looks like a big white square. So I said, what you need, what we're gonna do is you're gonna read the label, and in that label are a lot of words, and you're going to use those words to write four lines of anything. And here's the label, and here's the words. Look at these gorgeous words, white grid, reflective, luminescent, um, microspheres, glass, there's some lovely words in this label. So I let them go, I let them do it. And when we came back, just like with the kids or the teens, we, we stood around in our circle and each of the ladies read their poem. And the unbelievable thing is not only did they read their poem and then we strung the poems together, but they were able to see that now that they look at this very same work. They had such a great understanding. They had such, so many new ideas and thoughts about this Mary Kors work and about the other minimalist works that came to them through words. They didn't have to do an art history course in the era of minimalism. All they had to do really was read the label and think how they felt. So poetry Really, if you go, when the museum opens and you go back and you stand in front of a work, I highly encourage everyone to look at the label and write down four lines and you will be amazed at how transformed your understanding of that artwork will be. It was one of my biggest rewards of being a docent, that, that moment in time. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, and this idea of using poetry in the museums, we actually got to have a fantastic training um, with our team and some of our docents um, with an incredible museum educator, uh, Corinne Zimmerman, who's based in Boston. Absolutely incredible. We we're very, very lucky to have that experience. Um, and it really informed a lot of us um, in the ways that we teach and the ways that we brought words and poetry um, into the museum. So Lorraine, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, Let's continue on. Our last story is from Francis. Um, sorry, Francis, you're last again. You were last to introduce yourself. You're last with your story, but I love this story because you bring up the idea of wonder, which is one of my favorite ideas, especially when it comes to art and the museum. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about this concept of wonder. And I was actually, looking back at some other thoughts I had about being a docent from almost 10 years ago, and I actually used the word wonder back then in um, an answer I gave. I often begin my school group tours specifically, but I can do this with adults or anyone, um, by saying I am a teacher, which we are, but I don't give tests, which we don't, um, which means I am looking for people's observations, for kids' observations, for their connections, for their thoughts about an object, not for answers. Um, and that is about seeing and sharing art, not about sort of analyzing and deciding exactly what something might mean, because what it means to you might mean something totally different to another. And so I don't want inhibitions. I don't want hard and fast answers to have to get in the way of wonder. And that's without inhibitions, you have that, that 
that wonder. So every time I tour a group, whether it's children or adults, first time museum goers, out of towners, tourists, I have to let myself go in that way with that wonder. I go with wonder all the time. And um, often maybe I feel like I'm on the fly and maybe in a way it's okay. We are authorities as docents. We have to give museum manners. We have to talk about where we're going on a tour. How are we gonna get there? Are we gonna do the stairs? Are we gonna use the elevator? Would someone um, need assistance? Does someone um, need to know exactly what the curriculum is that we're trying to follow? Because a lot of times teachers do want to get a, a teaks lesson out of what we do. But I think if you approach something with wonder, you let yourself go as a docent, you anticipate and are excited about a tour as much as those you are touring. And that connects with the, with the audience. Um, I've even had adults who sort of look at me like, wow, are you seeing this for the first time? I'm like, no, not really. But I am actually as curious as I was about it because when I first saw it, as I am now, because I am seeing it with usually a new group who will give me new insights. So. I often sometimes can get over enthusiastic and maybe overwhelm a group, but then I check myself and realize if I hold back and become a participant with the same kind of wonder that I wish for my viewers, then I can see a work with fresh eyes and gain new insights because our permanent collection is rotating much more rapidly than it used to, which is exciting for docents. And we have so many exhibitions that come in as touring and special temporary exhibitions. But um, oftentimes we tour a lot of the same works and it pays off to use wonder when you tour. Thank you so much, Francis. I love that you brought up this idea that our collection is not stagnant. Um, and so you can come back mm -hmm. so often and get a new experience every time that you come back. Sometimes it's gonna be, be because there are new works that are up in our permanent collection or um, in our special exhibition spaces, but sometimes it's also just the place that you're in and how you see a work in a different way. Um, and I agree, you know, I, there are certain works that I love to teach with and with different groups, you see completely new things, which is so exciting. Um, and so much about the way that we love to teach at the Blanton is that we want to hear from the visitors. We want to hear what they are seeing, what their experience with the work is. Of course, we wanna share our knowledge as well, but it's this beautiful dance between those two things. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. So uh, this is a moment for us to go ahead and answer any questions that you all have. We've had these beautiful stories um, from our educators uh, here at the Blanton, and uh, we would love to move to questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pop open this window. It looks like we've got um, a couple of questions here. One of them says, um, what misconception about being a museum docent or a gallery teacher would you like to debunk? Um, so anybody interested in answering that question? Oh, it looks like Dave has his hand up. Dave, do you wanna go ahead and answer that one? Well, yes, I mean, so one, one immediate thing that people are not expecting when uh, looking for a museum docent is me. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we can also talk about, um, there's, I mean, so people have addressed the idea that many viewers are coming to the experience expecting to be lectured at and informed and educated. And many of our efforts are about teaching the viewer to be able to move about the museum on their own and engage with artworks and have a rich experience of doing that without having someone with art education or a degree or other background knowledge to uh, explain it to. And that is one of the things that I really want to, to get across is that you can go to the museum and look at artworks and engage with them and have a, have a rich experience, even without someone detailing whatever narrative might be involved in the story that's depicted upon the, uh, the canvas in front of you. Thank you so much, Dave. 
Um, there's another question here about our um, docents who are also practicing artists. And I know, Dave, you are one of those, um, but for anybody else as well. Um, how does your mu museum teaching relate to or inform your artistic practice? Do we have any docents? Dave, we'll give you a break for a moment if there's another docent who's interested, but if not, then we can definitely go back to Dave. Okay, Dave, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, sure, so my experience in the galleries uh, definitely informs uh, my practices um, from a technical uh, viewpoint, looking at use of color, color theory, color balancing, and composition, and those sorts of technical elements of constructing an image, narrative elements in terms of storytelling. Uh, storytelling in a single frame on a canvas can inform not only the still image making that I do, but also video um, that I'm constructing, the idea of looking at how someone has constructed a narrative in a still image can inform how you use the expanded canvas of a video in order to take uh, communicate a story and it make that as as rich a communication as possible. Thank you so much, Dave. And we do have a lot of practicing artists um, who are docents. We have visual artists. We have um, photographers and painters. We have. Um, docents who are um, poets and writers. Um, we have docents, I'm not currently practicing, but I work in the theater. I know Lorraine has worked in the theater in the past too. And so a lot of different areas of art um, from our docents and our gallery teachers. Um, we've got a really fun question here now that what is the weirdest, funniest, or most unexpected question that you have been asked? Anyone interested in that one? I'll give you a moment to think about that one. But go ahead and raise your hand, panel, if you have something that's coming up for you. So this question is always that always asked when I go to Mission Missions, and it is the piece that has the 600,000 pennies. And some of the kids will always invariably ask the question, what happens if I take a penny? <laughs> Will security know? Um, yeah. they, and they always want to know how many pennies are there. If we are going on a tour, they always want to know if they can go in and touch the pennies, which I know has changed a little bit um, since that, uh, that piece was first installed. But yes, I always get a question about the pennies and what happens if I can take a penny. <laughs> yes, that is definitely true. Unfortunately, um, you can no longer touch the pennies, um, which I think has, there's a sigh of relief that comes for, for teachers and, and our gallery um, assistants uh, for not being able to touch the pennies. So young people and, and adults loved touching the pennies, um, but security does know, Kim is telling us, security does know if you take a penny, so do not try it. Um, Francis, it looks like that you have maybe a weird or interesting or unexpected uh, question or comment. Well, I don't know, but I would think most people know the oil field girls. They've been around for quite a while. The piece um, that is in the one of the row, round galleries, um, blanking on the artist's name. Jerry Bywaters. Yes, Jerry Bywaters, the first DMA. Yeah. Uh, director, I believe, Dallas Museum of Art. And it's one of the most fantastic pieces. It actually goes out alone quite a bit because um, it is so well known nationally. And he was part of the Dallas Nine. It's got a great history. It's a, it's, if, as a Texan, I feel connection to it growing up in, you know, in Dallas and, and seeing these ladies, these fashionable ladies portrayed in um, the Dallas Morning News, Neiman Marcus ads. And he sort of kind of copies their posture and then you've got this sort of East Texas, West Texas, you know, it's definitely oil field vibe, but they're all dressed up. And I had, this is a long time ago, and I had some very um, intelligent and also very bold teenagers or young teenagers who said, 
what are those ladies doing? And I thought, what do you mean, what are they doing? <laughs> and I thought, I know exactly what they think they're doing. I said, well, they're just looking, it's the, you know, it's it, women had to go to work. It was the, the men were at work. The, I, they're not dressed to be oil field workers, but they were part of the scene. And so we just had to kind of scurry along. I thought, oh my goodness, where are the chaperones? I don't really want to talk about what position they had in the oil fields, but they look awfully well-dressed in their boots and in their hat and bow. And um, I know the woman on the left in the black might have been the mentor of the younger, more naive, snow white looking gal. And I, I think about that whenever I approach oil field girls, I think, you know, these ladies definitely knew what was going on and they dressed for the occasion. Now the occasion will just leave up to everyone's imagination. Oh, thank you so much for that story, Francis. So now you all know that if your gallery teacher um, is giggling a little bit uh, when they are approaching a work of art, uh, there may have been a, a strange or unnerving question asked at that work of art. Um, it looks like we have gotten through our questions. Um, so I think that we're gonna go ahead and call that a night for our conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you here. Um, and before we go, just a couple of reminders. We'll be announcing our September curated conversation on our website and on our social media pages within the next week. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you want to watch any of our past curated conversations or this one, um, take virtual art tours um, or explore um, any other of our hashtag museum from home content, um, you can go to the blantonmuseum.org slash museum from home. If you'd like to show your support, you can become a member at blantonmuseum.org slash membership, or you can support our Blanton Together Fund, which is at blantonmuseum.org slash support. Um, there, a gift of any amount is really appreciated and it helps us to bring cultural and educational resources to our community. If you just wanna know about upcoming programs or any other news from the museum, you can sign up for our newsletter that is at blantonmuseum.org slash subscribe. And finally, if you have any topics that you would like us to see that you would like to see covered in our curated conversations, you can drop us a line at media at blantonmuseum.org. Thank you again, and we hope to see you all again next month. We will see you later.